I'm going to ask everyone just to mute because I think maybe that would help with some of the feedback uh, when you're not speaking. So thank you very much. Welcome to the Affordable Housing Preservation Task Force Mobile Home and Manufactured Housing Subcommittee meeting. It is November the 10th to conduct this meeting wholly electronically and to effectuate the emergency procedures authorized by FOIA, the Affordable Housing Preservation Task Force Mobile Home and Manufactured Housing Subcommittee needs to make certain findings and determinations for the record. It is a bit cumbersome, so I ask in advance for your patience. First, because each member of the Affordable Housing Preservation Task Force Mobile Home and Manufactured Housing Subcommittee is participating in this meeting from a separate location, we must verify that a quorum of members is participating and that each member's voice is clear, audible, and at an appropriate volume for all of the other members. Accordingly, I'm going to conduct a roll call and ask each task force member participating in this meeting to state your name and the location from which you are participating. I ask that each of you pay close attention to ensure that you can hear each of your colleagues. Following this roll call, we will vote to establish that every member can hear every other member. So starting with the roll call, I am Michelle Crocker and I am in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, David Levine. Yes, hi, good afternoon. I'm Dave Levine and I am in Alexandria, Virginia. Eric Marabojek. Eric, Virginia. Eric, could you repeat that? You were muted. Thank you. Uh, hi, this is Eric Mary Bojic from Fairfax, Virginia. Thank you. Um, Jill Norcross. Hi, this is Jill Norcross from Reston, Virginia. Thank you. Ken McMillan. I don't think Ken has joined us yet. Okay. Uh, Rick Edson. Rick Edson from Bethesda, Maryland. Okay, thank you. At this point, I will pass the virtual gavel to committee member David Levine so that I may be heard to make the requisite motion. David, I am passing the gavel to you. Okay. I move that each member's voice may be adequately heard by each other member of the Affordable Preservation Task Force Mobile Home and Manufactured Housing Subcommittee. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, second, having established that each member's voice may be heard by every other member, we must next establish the nature of the emergency that compels these emergency procedures, the fact that we are meeting electronically, what type of electronic communication is being used, and how we have arranged for public access to this meeting. Therefore, I move that the state of emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for the affordable housing mobile home task force to physically assemble and unsafe for the public to physically attend any such meeting. And that as such, FOIA's usual procedures, which require the physical assembly of the mobile home task force um, and the physical presence of the public cannot be implemented safely or practically. I further move that the Affordable Housing Preservation Task Force Mobile Home and Manufactured Housing Subcommittee may conduct this meeting electronically through a dedicated audio conferencing line and that the public must access this meeting by calling 1-844-621-3956 and entering access code 173-448-7002. Anyone interested in joining the WebEx for the visual component must click the link which was included in the public meeting notice and which will be included in the minutes to join the meeting through WebEx. It is so moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, it's next required that all of the matters addressed on today's agenda are necessary for continuity in Fairfax County government and are necessary to continue operations and the discharge of the Affordable Housing Preservation Task Force, Mobile Home and Manufactured Housing Subcommittee's lawful purposes, duties and responsibilities. The meeting comports with continuity in government as it ensures that the subcommittee can engage in the work to ensure the development of strategies to enable the successful preservation of affordable housing in Fairfax County, for which time is of the essence. 
failure to take these actions could cause irreparable harm to the preservation of affordable housing in the county. It is so moved. Is there a second? A second. Thank you very much. All right, um, David, you, if you would please hand the gavel, the virtual gavel back to me and we will continue the meeting. Okay, well, I'm handing the gavel, the virtual gavel back to uh, Michelle. Thank you very much. All right, welcome everybody. Um, we have, I think, what will be an interesting, very interesting discussion uh, today. And we're going to start with uh, Graham Owen. Graham is with the Department of um, Planning and Development. Uh, and Graham is going to give us a presentation on uh, kind of the land uses for mobile home communities in the county. And we're going to look at some of the uh, county the, um, sites for the mobile home as well. All right, thank you, Michelle. I was looking for the mute button there. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. So we have, I think, two presentations today. Um, I'm going to start off by going over kind of the existing uh, policy landscape that we have in Fairfax County regarding um, mobile homes and manufactured homes. Um, so as we all know, and we kind of went over at the first couple of um, meetings of the task force, um, we have the comprehensive plan, which has general guidance on how land should be developed in the future. Um, and this is separate and apart from zoning, uh, which is the ordinances and the, the regulations that govern the ways in which land is actually is actually to be used. So what I wanted to do with this presentation is give a, an overview of both how uh, mobile home mobile home parks fit into the existing comprehensive plan and into the uh, existing zoning ordinance. And then Huna, I think, is going to take it away talking in a little bit more detail about uh, the the actual mobile home parks, the eight of them that are located in the county. So, I will start it off uh, with the the actual mobile home parks that we have. <clears throat> See if I can share my screen in a larger view. Okay, is that better? Can everyone see that a bit better? Okay, great. It is better. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So this is a, an, a map showing, um, as, as most of you are familiar with, the Richmond Highway Corridor. So the Richmond Highway Corridor, Route 1, extending down from uh, the city of Alexandria down south to Lorton. Um, I, I think most of the most of you that are on this call are, are familiar with kind of the general area in, in Mount, straddling Mount Vernon and the lease supervisor districts. So there are six mobile home parks in the Richmond Highway Corridor, uh, which are all labeled uh, here. They're labeled as the, the pink areas. They're not the, the red dots. Um, the pink areas represent the mobile home parks. The red dots actually represent the BRT stops that are planned along, along the highway as a part of Embark. So this is a good, uh, a good image kind of showing you where they are uh, in relation to not only the BRT, uh, planned BRT stations, but also in relation to the CBCs or the community business centers, which are the areas shown in yellow. Uh, and these are the areas where uh, redevelopment uh, is planned as a part of the embark um, for for the commercial areas, uh, mostly for a mixed use, a, a variety of mixed use options uh, in those CBCs. Between the CBCs, you have green areas. These green areas are what we call suburban neighborhood areas between the CBCs, uh, which are planned predominantly to remain residential in character, but there are uh, some commercial uses that are that are uh, that are permitted under or planned recommended under the existing guidance. Um, so I'll let Huna give you give you kind of the more characteristics of each of these, but just as they go from, from north to south, you have uh, PennDOT, which has 90 units uh, currently. Then you have the Woodley Hills Mobile Home Park, uh, which most of you are familiar with as a, as a component of the, uh, the North Hill project. So that's a, a more recent park uh, built in 1991 as a part of that redevelopment. Then you have the largest park in the county, Audubon Estates, which is on the Lee District side, uh, as well as Harmony Place, which is immediately south of that. Um, going a little bit further down, once you get into the South County Center area, you have uh, two mobile home parks that are immediately adjacent to each other, the Angleside Mobile Home Park and Ray's Mobile Home Colony, uh, which are, as I said, immediately adjacent to each other, to one another, and about 115 units in total across those, across those units. There are two additional mobile home parks in the county. One is in the Waples Mill area at the intersection or near the intersection of Lee Highway and Waples Mill. 
Um, most of you will be familiar with kind of a, a local landmark, Chewy's, the uh, the Mexican restaurant. So Waples Mill is immediately to the west of Chewy's, and there are 152 units in the current in the current park. Uh, the last one, the eighth one, is out in Chantilly. So it's in the meadows of Chantilly. Uh, it's in an industrial area that's zoned and planned predominantly for industrial uses. So the first thing that we look to when we're looking at the comprehensive plan uh, is what we call the policy plan. The policy plan is a set of countywide policies, ordinance or po policies, guidelines, uh, and objectives that deal with the way that uh, certain uh, elements of the comprehensive plan should be evaluated. So we have a land use element, we have an environmental element, we have a housing element, uh, we have a variety of elements that deal with specific topic areas. And there is guidance right now, currently, in the comprehensive plan regarding mobile home retention. Uh, it's in Appendix 10 of the land use element. So for reference, I'd be happy to send around a link so that folks can take a look at it. Uh, but there is some existing guidance. Uh, the guidance dates back to uh, the advent of the current comprehensive plan in, in its current in incarnation uh, in 1991 with the Planning Horizons effort, which reorganized the comprehensive plan holistically uh, from what it had been uh, in the 70s and the 80s. So. This is something that's been around in the comprehensive plan, more or less in its in its original form uh, since 1991. Um, for those for those of you that are following along, it, the, the type might be a little small, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it. There are three slides that contain the guidance. It's really not that long, uh, but it is important in, in terms of how we deal with uh, mobile home parks you know, writ large across the county. So mobile home parks, uh, mobile homes provide an important alternative source, and this is a citation from the comprehensive plan. Mobile home parks um, or mobile homes provide an important alternative source of housing affordable to low and moderate income households. In Fairfax County, this is a relatively small but important segment of the housing inventory. However, in many cases, the existing plan designation and the underlying zoning are in conflict. Further, many of these mobile home parks can be redeveloped in other uses as a matter of right, leading to a loss of affordable housing and the displacement of residents. It is recommended that this issue be studied further to determine whether it is appropriate to replan these sites to continue their use for mobile home parks. In the interim, if an existing mobile home park is to be displaced due to redevelopment of the property under the existing zoning prior to the adoption of revised area plans, every effort should be made by the property owner to accommodate the displaced units or pads on adjacent property if such property exists and can be developed in a manner that does not thwart the achievement of sound land use planning objectives. The Board of Supervisors should ex exercise the flexibility to consider overriding site-specific land use recommendations on a case-by-case -case basis as a means to achieve the affordable housing objectives through retention of mobile home parks. And this is the last one. Redevelopment of parcels of land for mobile home park use should only be permitted if it can be accomplished in a manner that does not adversely affect surrounding properties by creating an environment for change in land use or adversely affect the adequacy and availability of public utilities and services or water, water quality. Any such project should be effectively screened and buffered from existing or planned residential development and should be sensitive to the environment. The applicant should file a rezoning application on the subject property to our MHP, which uh, for, for those of you that are unfamiliar, stands for Residential Mobile Home Park, for consideration of such a proposal. Further, assistance substantially offsetting the costs of relocation for displaced residents should be provided by the property owner and a significant portion of any new pads created, created under this provision should remain affordable. So with that guidance, we have a, we're doing a couple of things there. Um, if you go back, I'll go back two slides again. Escape and then. Oops. Okay, so it's doing a couple of things here. It's recognizing that mobile home parks provide an important source of affordable housing. Um, and then for, I think one of the important things that might be a kind of a sounding board for discussion uh, is this is the second sentence where it's talking about having a plan designation and a zoning, underlying zoning that are in conflict. Uh, it creates what some call a grandfathering situation where existing, existing uses can continue, in some cases can be replaced, but you can't add on in a lot of cases when you have a non-compliant facility, basically when your use is uh, in conflict with the existing provisions that are in the zone uh, in which it's situated. 
This is the case in a couple of the mobile home parks that I'll get to in a second, not all, uh, but it is important as we're evaluating uh, which of these sites um, are kind of in a, in, a, in, in, a, in a situation where they might be redeveloped in the future uh, and the existing kind of context in which they operate legally. Uh, there are guidance, there, there is guidance that indicates that um, you do have area plans that uh, have guidance regarding the dispensation of mobile home parks, uh, but does with this section provide the board with the ability to look at mobile home parks and the affordability that they provide as a, as a, you know, as a public good and allows them the flexibility to override site specific plan recommendations. Uh, one example is the Waples Mill uh, mobile home park, which I'll get to in a second, where a rezoning application was filed on that in the 90s, uh, which allowed for, um, which otherwise would have allowed for one to two units to the acre uh, as a part of a swap of land uh, that would allow for some of the units to be relocated elsewhere on the site. Uh, under the existing comp plan language, that wouldn't have been provided for, that, that'd be too dense, uh, but the board does have the ability to allow for um, overriding considerations uh, to, and with the effort of preserving affordability and preserving mobile home parks writ large. So they were able to get higher density despite a comprehensive plan recommendation for the site uh, that said that it needed to be relatively low density. Uh, and then finally, this section is mostly regarding uh, the development of new mobile home parks or redevelopment of areas for mobile home park use. So um, this is probably less applicable unless we're talking about areas that uh, that our existing mobile home parks where there might be a need to redevelop them for that exact same use. So um, I flag that because there is language in here regarding a relocation assistance. And that's something that I think that we'll want to that we'll want to discuss um, as, as a part of this this committee's work. So here is a, the inventory of the existing mobile home parks that are located in the county with their location. Um, so the there are, excuse me, six that are located on the Richmond Highway corridor. Four of those are located in the Mount Vernon district side. Two are located on the Lee district side. Um, so you have uh, zoning, uh, a variety of zoning districts where these mobile, mobile home parks are located. C8 uh, is a common one along the corridor. That's a general highway commercial uh, zoning designation where uh, mobile home parks are not a permitted use. So this is one of those situations where existing uses are grandfathered. You could replace a trailer, for example, if you needed to, but we can't add um, add to the noncompliance. So no additional additional trailers above what's there today uh, would be permitted. Um, in addition to this, you have your, in addition to your zoning, you also have your comprehensive plan recommendations for these sites, which in most cases are residential use at a density of five to eight dwelling units to the acre. And several of the mobile home parks along the corridor have, have that five to eight dwelling units to the acre as their base recommendation. However, if certain conditions are met, uh, they do have redevelopment options, either as a part of the Embark study uh, and the Embark process, or in some cases that predate those studies that allow for higher density uh, with consolidation, for example, of, of multiple parcels to ensure that you have adequate area uh, for, for a redevelopment. So in some cases, uh, with Ingleside, Rays, and Pendaw, for example, there already is a redevelopment option on those on those sites as they exist today. Um, some, such as the Woodley Hills uh, Mobile Home Park, that just has a base plan recommendation of five to eight dwelling units to the acre without a redevelopment option, uh, and that makes sense. It's one of the sites that's a um, that's a, a county site, and that's one where we you know, we want to preserve that as a as a site for affordable housing in the future. Um, other sites, the Harmony Place. Um, has a base plan recommendation of residential use at five to eight dwelling units to the acre, similar to the others. Uh, it does have some site specific guidance given its location next to a creek uh, that indicates that mobile home parks uh, that are located in floodplains should be relocated. And this is for obviously for the for the safety of those that are that are that would otherwise be affected by floods. And then finally, Audubon Estates, the the largest park in the county, that has a base plan recommendation of five to eight dwelling units to the acre, but without a, uh, a redevelopment option. Um, Audubon, as well as the next one that I'll talk about, um, have this RMHP residential mobile home park zoning. Um, this is a, is a unique zoning district that allows for a very limited set of uses as a very limited set of development criteria that really try to keep these areas as mobile home parks and allow them to continue to operate as mobile home parks uh, today and, and in perpetuity. So 
unlike the C8 zones, um, the parks that are located in these RMHP districts, um, the mobile home parks are a permitted use. This is one where um, all things being equal, as long as development standards are 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 followed, um, parks can can expand. They can they can reduce. The number of units can can be um, can be changed consistent with the density recommendations. Um, finally, the last two, uh, Waples Mill, as I mentioned, does have a, a density recommendation of one to two dwelling units to the acre currently. Um, this was subject to a rezoning in the 90s, uh, where the Chewy's, Chewy's Shopping Center came in and, and took a portion of that um, existing mobile home park. A lot of those trailers were relocated to elsewhere, mostly at the back of that property. Uh, and so the the language that you say that you see here in the comprehensive plan is is a part of that. So mobile home park uh, should remain located in this area. There's a recognition uh, that this is one of the areas of the county where we, we do want to keep this as a mobile home park in perpetuity and in accordance with the guidelines that I mentioned previously, which are the countywide recommendations. Uh, and then finally, we have Dulles Meadows. So this is located in an in industrial zone, I3 light intensity industrial zone where the comprehensive plan has an industrial base. So it has a, a base recommendation of industrial use. Um, and then it does have site specific guidance that indicates that the neighborhood, the park, it should be retained, but it should not be expanded. And this is due to the airport noise. So the, the comp plan indicates that it's in the greater than 60 uh, dBN noise contour. Um, so if redeveloped, relocation assistance should be provided. And this is another, uh, another text that's in included in the comprehensive plan today uh, for the specific site. Uh, one last thing that I'll leave you with in terms of um, the existing the existing uh, number of units that are located in the county. So this is a an inventory. Uh, if Eric, Eric had asked a question, I think at our first meeting, um, what's the total number of units uh, in the in the county, and how has that number changed over time? So I've done some done some digging with our in our comprehensive planning records and and found some good information. Uh, we didn't use the term mobile home park really until the 1970s in a, in a meaningful way in terms of um, tabulating statistics uh, and really thinking of mobile homes as permanent permanent dwellings. Uh, but the, the county did start tabulating and, and listing mobile home parks um, as a type of as a type of dwelling unit, uh, just like townhouses or multifamily units, for, ex for example, um, starting in the 70s. So we have a good baseline, almost 2,500 units. Uh, of mobile home parks were located, or of mobile homes were, were located in 1977. That number stayed the same throughout the 70s, and then there was a slight reduction in the 80s, uh, and then into the 90s, that's when we started to see a reduction in the total number. There are a couple of kind of key key developments that were the result of this. The first one's probably uh, the most the most famous is the Woodley Nightingale redevelopment. Um, this is the the, you know, the, the North Hill project. So that was a, a reduction, a net reduction in units. Um, also Oak Grove and the Mount Vernon trailer park. Uh, this is the area that some people just know it as the Walmart site. Um, this is a, an area that didn't undergo a, a zoning action. Uh, this is a buy right use Walmart in a C8 zone. So this is one where uh, the county wasn't, uh, you, we didn't have a zoning zoning action associated with it. So that was a, that was a loss of units about 200 or so. Uh, and then finally, the Waples, Waples Mill, which I've mentioned previously, where uh, it wasn't a you know total a total uh, loss of the of the trailer park, but there was a, a net reduction in units uh, as a result of the zoning actions in the '90s. So those are the three main um, main points of of loss of total numbers of units. I, I, I'd note that what we were looking at in terms of this graph right here is the total number of units, not the number of households. Um, so I think that's just important as we're as we're thinking through what does this mean for displacement. Just want to be very clear that this is uh, looking at units and not individuals, not households. Um, in some cases, trailers are you know abandoned, uh, but most are obviously occupied. So I just wanted to give that as a you know as a baseline for the you know what we're what we're dealing with and what we've seen um, over the over the past fifty years or so. And all right, uh, last last couple of things regarding zoning. So we, as I mentioned, we do have one zoning district in the county that specifically deals with mobile home parks. There's a couple of residential districts where mobile homes are permitted just kind of on their own, but there's really only one zoning district where you have mobile home parks as a permitted use, and that's the RMH. Um, so the purpose is to provide for mobile home parks 
and to allow, their, allow for other selected uses that are compatible with the residential character of the district. Um, so a couple of things that are permitted, mobile home parks, obviously single family homes are both permitted uses. Um, there are other uses that are, that, that are permitted with a special permit or a special exception. Um, I would note that detached um, or, excuse me, attached, this should say attached, attached or multifamily homes are not permitted uses in those zoning districts. So that's, I think that's important in terms of when we're thinking about redevelopment and what might, uh, what might happen in those zoning districts under the existing zoning. Those, those uses are not permitted uh, with a special exception or a special permit. However, a variety of commercial uses are. Um, a maximum density of six dwelling units to the acre. Oh, another couple of development standards, no homes are permitted in floodplains. So this is kind of getting at that, that, that element that I was talking about with, um, with Harmony Place, where we want to make sure that you know, people are being provided for and the pads are located in sites that are, that are safe. Uh, and then there are kind of more standard issue performance standards for on-site drive aisles, um, the, the character of the pads, the sizing of the pads, open space requirements, uh, the kinds of things that you'd expect uh, you'd have in a, in, in a list of zoning district regulations. And finally, I'll leave you with this. Um, there is some additional language in the general provisions. So this is section two of the zoning ordinance that are dealing specifically with mobile home parks as well. And so this allows for an increase in, from, a, from the zoning's perspective, an increase in total dwelling units to the acre by a factor of up to 50%. So this is when applications are going through the Board of Supervisors uh, processes just to ensure that we have some flexibility when we're dealing with mobile home parks uh, so that we can allow for sites to, to change and for site and for units to be preserved on these sites. Uh, but that's the last slide that I had. Uh, I'm happy to keep all this up. I know I threw a lot of hot planning language and zoning district regulations at you, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Graham. That was really very, very helpful. Um, do any of the committee members have questions? Yeah, this, this is Eric. Uh, Graham, thank you very much for the presentation. It was um, lots of useful information to think about. One, one question I have on the RMHP zoning. So it, it permits mobile homes and uh, detached housing only. Um, was there any consideration given to um, att a de attached housing, say multifamily high rise, if it were uh, affordable or targeted to the same kind of income limits as a mobile home park resident profile? Because right now it doesn't seem like that would be allowed. So that's a great question. And I would, uh, two things with that. These are the only types of residential uses that are permitted in the RMHP zone. There are other types of uses that we typically want to see in standard issue residential districts like um, places of worship, for example, uh, there are other types of commercial uses, some institutional uses that are also permitted. So um, I just, I want to say that the, in terms of your question though, in terms of high, higher density, um, no, those are, those are currently not permitted. And I think the, I, I think that the idea that that's behind that was that we wanted to be able to preserve these as mobile home parks uh, rather than, you know, kind of the, the idea of being able to move people from trailers or mobile homes to other types of other types of housing. That being said, you know, if if that's something that we wanted to explore um, as a part of this as a part of the subcommittee process, I think that that's uh, certainly a valid thing, and we could continue to talk about it. Other questions? Yes. Hi, um, Graham, um, and thanks, Michelle. I'd just like to ask a couple of questions. Um, and that was a very good presentation, Graham. Thank you. That was very interesting information. On the six mobile home parks along Richmond Highway, um, are they envisioned to continue in the Embark Richmond Highway plan? Because I know PennDAW, I had seen um, sort of a visioning document about sort of after the development, and it was completely developed. It was not a mobile home park. But are there some cutouts for those six parks to remain as parks, as mobile home parks? It's a great question. And you, I, the answer is some of them and some, some yes and some no. 
Um, so the first one that you mentioned, PENDA, uh, that is one that has a redevelopment option on it currently as a part of Embark. Uh, and it does, you know, it has, it, it shows a grid of streets that go through the site. You know, it shows a mix, mixture of uses that would be permitted. So that's one, that whole, that whole PENDA CBC area is, is, is planned for redevelopment. So the current okay. language does not, does not provide for it to, to remain uh, as a part of that redevelopment. Uh, it's not to say that it couldn't, but um, there, you know, the the larger plan for that area does include a you know a mixed use, higher density uh, redevelopment option currently. Um, okay. Woodley, Woodley Hills is outside of the CBCs and the SNAs, so it's it's off the corridor. It's considered off the corridor, even though a little little, little portion of it is uh, or actually no, it doesn't front on the corridor. So that's included in the uh, embark plan. Uh, it's just a part of the Mount Vernon planning district and it's proposed to remain um, as is. Um, Harmony Place and Audubon. Um, I have to get back to you on Harmony Place. Audubon is off the corridor as well. Uh, so that's not envisioned to have any sort of redevelopment option on it. Uh, I believe that Harmony Place is similarly situated, but I can double check. Um, and then raise raise and angle side um, as, as you're as you're familiar with the the SSPA process mm -hmm. in that's in an SNA where Embark didn't change the density recommendations or the land use recommendations. Um, that being said, it is going as you know it's going through an SSPA process um, separate from the Embark study uh, to look at uh, a separate or a second redevelopment option on it for for higher higher density. Um, okay. So, yeah. So it. it some of them, yes. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, Pendos, certainly. Um, that's probably the one that's the most clear answer of yes. Um, but the others are actually uh, mostly out, out of the embark um, density, mm -hmm. level level density. Okay, good. Cool. I, I had actually one other question for you. I was I was actually surprised at the inventory you showed because it's you're saying it's about a 500 unit loss. And it looks like it goes back to the 70s, so maybe the last 50 years, well, it's 1977, which surprised me a little bit because I was expecting a bigger loss. I thought there was, you know, more loss of these units. And the other thing that I think would be interesting with the inventory is that, let's say you have a mobile home so it was put on a site on a pad in 1977, and it could be that there have been replacement homes put on that site, correct? So it could be that you actually have sort of improved housing on that site because you have a more recent uh, mobile home put on that site. And you're just counting that the number stays the same because it's, there's a home on that pad and that hasn't changed. So that's correct. Yeah, this is looking at the raw aggregate number of units. So it doesn't, it's no indication of, you know, one was placed there in 1953 and it's remained to this day, or uh, right. that be counted the exact same way as if it were replaced in 95 uh, with another newer, newer unit, uh, which right. remains to this day. That's, that's correct. And I just bring that up because I think there's a real um, misperception out there about mobile home parks that they're they're often viewed as substandard housing, and we actually had some of that on that SSPA uh, task force and some of the discussion around Rays and Ingleside. You know, people were saying some people were saying not all, but they really view this as sort of an eyesore, substandard housing. And I, I don't know that that's, that's really uh, true to, to start because you could have had, you could have had improvements in the housing and new housing put on those sites over time. Um, and it may be very adequate, very, you know, kind of optimal housing uh, and certainly affordable housing uh, in the current day. So I just, it'd be kind of interesting to see also just what the, average age of these homes are, you know, just kind of like, what are we really talking about here? Are they more recent or are they, or are they older? And I think that would also help to frame this discussion around this being adequate housing or not. I mean, that's not certainly, that's certainly not true for Harmony Place, which is in a floodplain, and I get that. I mean, that's, that's just, you know, you can't, 
inhabit that site because of that situation. But um, I think there are other sites and other mobile home parks that may be providing very, you know, very good solid housing that people view differently. I mean, they see it as just all substandard. Jill, I think those are really good points. And we can get oh, go ahead. Go ahead. A bit, of, a, a bit of a follow up question to David's point, and mine really is around engagement of the residents that live there and their requests for any sort of zoning change or preservation efforts. Or do you, you know, hear from them? How organized, I guess, are the residents that live in each of these? It depends. Um, because I know there's a lot of conversation nationally around resident owned communities. And so I was just curious what the, if that's been organized in the county at all, how you've seen that. Absolutely. I, I think Dave, David and I are familiar with Angleside and Raves in particular since it's a, it's a, a recent, recent land use, um, you know, ran, recent land use uh, application or, or nomination as we call it. Um, it if you if you want to jump in here, feel free. Um, what I was what I would say is that the they've been engaged uh, as a part of the the nomination process when it was going through the task force. Um, they, they were organized, uh, and I think that one of the things that we will um, that we will continue to have in terms of conversations with them um, is a real need to engage them um, in Spanish, and that's a real uh, that's been a real kind of hurdle. Um, you know, in terms of our our process and our our understanding of how do we better engage people, uh, and something that you know is is obviously tied in with one Fairfax, um, but it's something that's um, it's not easy, but there is a way to do it, and I think that we were able to do it with the task force meetings you know, on the on the on the raise and and angle side. We'll continue to do it with the planning commission hearings that are um, that are going to be for the screening phase of SSPA uh, next week. Um, and so we're we're looking forward to you know, continuing that engagement. Should it should it be added to the work program? If it's not, it's not. Um, but um, if it is added to the work program, I think that we'll have you know, a lot of opportunities to to engage with the community because uh, they've they've not they've we've been very happy that they've been engaged. You know, in some cases, you might think that uh, people would not want to speak out uh, for a variety of you know situations, but uh, that's not been the case since we're we're, we're glad. So I've, I've been asked that we told that we need to move along. Um, so um, hold your questions until the end, or, or we're happy to, if we have time, um, take them again. I just want to say with regard to David's comment, which is, I think, a good one about the age of the mobile homes, the homes themselves um, may be improved. But I think um, what I'm very interested in is understanding the maintenance and the infrastructure of some of these places that maybe create communities that are unsightly if roads haven't been uh, paved or if maintenance hasn't been upheld um, in these communities. And I think that's we need a better handle on that. So we're going to go to, thank you, Graham, so much. That was so helpful. And I'm sure we will come back because you give us a lot of really good information that we'll probably have to come back and refer to, but we're, we're going to another um, PowerPoint presentation that uh, was put together to help us understand a little bit about um, who lives in these mobile home communities. Um, and I'm going to just provide a caveat for uh, some of this information that as we look at the demographics uh, the income, the characteristics of the people who are living there. Um, Judith, I think you can go to the first slide. I've got a big um, blank that's showing on the screen. Do you see that? Does everyone see there? Michelle, the way that we've solved this problem in the past is to share your screen other than sharing the application. Sometimes that works. Okay, Judith has got this. So, Sorry, I will. I'll, I'll switch it. Hang on. Okay. So I think what we should know about these next slides is that they are looking at um, demographic characteristics of census tracts. And of course, these parks are um, parts of larger census tracts. So the demographic information is not uh, 
totally accurate because it contains a larger area. Um, but it will give us a snapshot of each part. Thank you. That looks that looks great. Thank you. Jen. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, so this is this is the northernmost park um, that Graham was talking about that there is uh, it, it is not as you said, Graham, it is scheduled to be redeveloped or it is envisioned to be redeveloped, I should say, not scheduled. Um, but we can begin to look at some of the characteristics and this HPI is um, a healthy places index that has been developed by the Community Foundation of Northern Virginia that looks at various characteristics related to um, education, income level, poverty level, um, um, as you can see, access to food, public transportation. Again, I caution that these statistics are from an entire census tract area where the park is located. So you're going to get, um, I think if you could actually zero in on these parks, uh, you would see statistics that were much higher perhaps um, in some of these um, poverty levels or uh, housing burden cost levels without health insurance. So it begins to show us um, a snapshot of these. So we can go to the next one. The next slide. This is Woodley Hills. This is the, um, I think the park that the county owns. Uh, this was part of, the, as Graham told us though, Woodley Nightingale uh, community that was made smaller with the redevelopment of North Hill. Um, again, uh, you can see these statistics of, um, I would like to, uh, if we are able at some point in time to hone in and get a better understanding of, of the communities who live there. I don't know if that would require almost a door to door survey, um, but we can go to the next one. The Ingleside Mobile Home Park. Um, and feel free to comment on any of these if you notice. I think um, as we heard Graham's presentation, and as we begin to look at um, both the characteristics of, um, of these parks and the people who live there, I want us to begin to think about um, begin to formulate recommendations because our last meeting, which is in our next meeting in December, we will need to begin to come up with recommendations. So I want you to be thinking about things that you observe or notice that need to be addressed uh, as we go through these slides. We can go to the next one, please. And this is, uh, I guess the previous slide raised mobile home park was the, um, was the slot is the park that's scheduled for or that's asking for a redevelopment? Is that correct, Graham? Yes. Next one, please. Harmony Place. I think what I noticed about this, you can see the floodplain area in this park, um, which is considerable, and that can't be a really great um, environmental. Uh, place um, for people to live. I can imagine there are health issues there. Um, I don't know, but I'm just thinking that if that much of the park is in a floodplain, um, that's probably not a good thing. And we also know, um, and I think I can say this, that 18 of the mobile home parks in this community will have to be relocated because of the widening of Embark. That's been of the um, um, Richmond Highway that's been identified. So we know that 18 trailers will be moved and those um, that acquisition process will start, I think, mid or late in 2021, June, July, sometime. Next slide, please. Autobahn, you can see again the severe cost burden that um, that people have without health insurance, um, low access to quality foods, 
um, high um, Hispanic population, um, um, very few children enrolled in preschool. 82% uh, are not enrolled in preschool. Um, high school diploma or greater uh, is a good thing, but also you, you can see when you compile all these characteristics, you can see these um, pretty low health, healthy places index for these communities. And the next slide, please. And now uh, this is in the Braddock district. This is the Waple, Waples Mills mobile home park. This is the one gram that's in the um, industrial zoned area. Is that correct? No. That's the, uh, the one out at Dulles is in the industrial zone. Okay. This one's in our MHP zone. This, okay, that's right. This is the one that will remain in the appropriate zone will remain as mobile home. And then the last one, the next slide, um, can go to, yeah, thank you. In the Sully district. Um, So does any have, anyone have any comments or observations? Um, as I mentioned, we do want to begin to think about developing recommendations. Um, I, I think there are known challenges that have been identified and also some outstanding questions that we may have. So I'm going to open it up now to, to hear your comments and observations. Well, um, Michelle, thank you. That, that was really good information. Um, one thing I would say, one thing I noticed, uh, again, looking at Richmond Highway, where, where our service area is, is just the differences in life expectancy. I thought that was really dramatic. Just between Pendaw and Harmony Place and Audubon in particular, I think it was like at 82, 83 years up at Pendaw and like 78 years in Audubon and Harmony Place. And I think that kind of gets to the health challenges maybe and some of the you know the issues around healthcare access perhaps um food access that sort of thing uh in these areas i think that's a that's a good observation and also again i would i would like to see the condition uh the actual condition of the parks yeah. um, i think that uh could have some impact and um Graham, you talked about performance standards uh, in, I think, the plan language. Could you explain a little bit what that means? Is there an expectation that these parks are maintained with certain standards? Um, and is there an inspection process by the county or is anyone checking for compliance on those performance standards? So performance standards in the zoning ordinance um, typically are going to be involved when you're doing some sort of zoning action. So not necessarily a rezoning, but if, if property is being developed in some manner, that's when most of those performance standards are gonna come into play. Um, that being said, there is code enforcement. And so anybody can can call in to our to our code enforcement officers to, if there's something that's unsafe, if something that's in violation of the zoning ordinance um, is, is occurring on the site, um, then people can call and, and request an inspection in, in that manner. So. It's kind of that's a more standard process, not not just unique to mobile home parks, obviously, but uh, that that's that certainly can be um, you know, that that is something that can happen on these mobile home parks. Uh, but the performance standards, it's it's more when things are being developed, um, and I'm sure that they're so in an orderly fashion. But but the county doesn't seem to have a set of standards for um, what a mobile home park should have. So you could have a mobile home park that doesn't have paved roadways for instance or um, i don't know i'm asking are there any expectations in the uh, and, and i know some of these parks are very old so how do we address compliance or maintenance or safe living conditions or healthy living conditions if we don't have a set of standards for the parks 
If, if it might be helpful, I'll send around a copy of the M, our MHP zoning district right. regular so everybody has a copy of them. Because um, I, I think some of it will address what you're what you're talking about, but probably not 100 percent is my is my guess. Uh, but there, it's not that there's an absence of standards; they are they do exist. Um, but I'll just send them around so everybody has a copy of them. Okay, that would be helpful. Thank you. I think, Graham, you know, to follow up on Michelle's point, um, I guess when you are dealing with code compliance instead of zoning compliance, uh, which pertains to the infrastructure of the park, which is the responsibility of the park owner, and the condition of the units, which is the responsibility of the tenant, um, th those probably fall under some sort of zoning or, or code um, chapter, I guess, uh, which would be separate from the zoning compliance. So. I guess also for us, uh, in terms of thinking about compliance, there there are there, there's that split between what the part owner is responsible for, which is basically infrastructure, and what the tenants are responsible for because they own their own mobile units. Um, so there's you know two different um, parties, I guess, to to look at in terms of code enforcement. Um, one 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 observation I did have was, um, although we although we do have concentration of these things not just geographically, in terms of a lot of them being on the Route One corridor, um, there's also a, quite a bit of concentration because the two largest ones, Audubon, and the one in Chantilly, I think combined they account for maybe what seventy percent of the total number of of units, just those two properties. And those two properties are, are owned by, what, I, from what I can tell, larger national mobile home park owners or ownership groups. So I don't know if there's a difference in the standards between th those two larger ones, which are owned by, you know, I guess more institutional type investors or owners versus the other ones, which are much smaller in scale um in terms of their operation um so it just seems to me there's 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 some economies of dealing with you know i mean two owners basically account for the, the vast majority of the mobile home parks in fairfax county are there issues that we have not addressed or that you think need further exploration. Uh, you would like further um, more information uh, as we begin to think about recommendations going forward. And, and my sense is we're not going to, it's going to be difficult, I think, to make very definitive recommendations. Um, it may be that these recommendations are broader in scope, it may be that our recommendations talk about going beyond, um, you know, what we're doing here in this in this work group, this subcommittee, to some sort of standing um, committee. So I'm I'm sorry. I'm hearing that we have two public participants, and I don't know if there's a question from the public. Or I'm I'm asking. I should ask if there's a question for the pub from the public from anyone who is listening in. And if the public has a question, if they are able to write it in the chat to let us know, um, that would be wonderful. Um, and actually, I will unmute both just in case so that they can chime in. Any public questions? Uh, yeah, thanks. This is Mary. I'm sorry. It's hard to do the chat on the iPad. Um, yeah, I would suggest you guys to take a look at some of the really interesting things that are being done around the state and country with mobile home parks in terms of the land ownership, the financing, and the materials and construction and manufactured housing. And we're going to have all that on a Zoom meeting. I think I sent an invitation to everybody. Judith did. Did they send it out? I really encourage you to look at this. I was really blown away by some of this information. And before you make decisions, you should just see what's happening in other places. And it hasn't happened here yet, but it could. So I hope to see you Thursday tomorrow, Thursday night at 7. So Mary, thank you. Um, that's actually going to be the topic of our third meeting in December. 
uh, looking at what's happening at the state level and finding out about the mobile home coalitions and uh, resources and opportunities both for technical assistance for residents and for even potential um, park ownership by the residents. So uh, I guess the, the time is short if our um, Many members don't have any more questions. I am going to just let you know um, that this Thursday, the South County Task Force meeting will involve a presentation on mobile home affordable housing from seven to nine. I believe that um, at least everyone on the task force has gotten the invitation. And I think if you want, if others want uh, information about that, it is the South County Task Force. Uh, you, that you can Google and get the information. Uh, the next and final scheduled meeting of this work group will be December 1st at 2 p.m. Uh, we will really focus at that time on discussing um, with an equity lens the recommendations of our subcommittee um, that we want to put forward um, to the full task force. I would like to echo something that Jill said about community engagement and I, you know, from my perspective, um, I think we need to get the community in on these discussions sooner rather than later. Um, so that as we're formulating and making decisions and recommendations, we have their input, um, which I think is much uh, better than trying to take a policy that's been almost fully baked and take it out to the community and say, what do you think? Um, from, from my perspective, working through an equity lens is beginning with community engagement at the start of the process. So, um, be that we can get the word out to residents um, in the community uh, to attend the meetings. Uh, I know sometimes it's hard to do if they don't have internet access, if they don't have the appropriate devices, um, but we will maybe work on getting this word out to others um, to see if we can have more community engagement, at least at the, at the final meeting. Um, so as the, there will be presentations at our final meeting on statewide legislation, best practices, benefits and challenges, true home ownership opportunities um, and there, you know, we will discuss this kind of hybrid um, opportunity of ownership through true mobile homes. Um, I think that is it. If there are no mm -hmm. other questions or comments, mm -hmm. Judith, yes. So, yes, sorry, Michelle, I see Mary Payton has her hand raised, so I'm oh, going to okay. take her off. Of you. Sorry, Mary, I can't see. I couldn't see that. So, okay. okay. I just wanted to say we've got a, a policy now of, of uh, we pick up the disabled people's uh, slogan of nothing about us without us. And we do have the community members as one of our speakers. They'll be um, on a Zoom with um, one of their leaders and we'll have translations uh, for them. And they will be part of our Zoom meeting on Thursday, and I will try to get them to attend the last meeting, whatever meeting you want. We can get the word out to quite a few of the Route 1 people who live in home parks. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions or comments, it is 3 o'clock. I want to thank Graham and Judith and Huna and all the staff behind the scenes who make all this look wonderful and seamless. And thank you um, to the task force members. And we, I will see you, we will see each other on Thursday um, for the broader task force meeting and back here on December 1st for the, um, this subcommittee meeting. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Mm-hmm. <sighs>